On our phones and computers, we have passcodes. These passcodes gain you access to the world of information that sits at our fingertips. So much is available to us when that passcode is put in and the world of the internet and all the things attached to it opens up. If you don't know the passcode, then you're locked out of the access. So much is available, but if there is a passcode and you don't know it, then what's available is not beneficial. It's there, but you can't use it. But you haven't been able to enter in. You haven't been able to access what's available to you. In the kingdom of God, in the plan of God, in the program of God, there is much to be accessed regarding my life, regarding your life, and regarding God's plan. But he has a passcode. One of the reasons why many of us live confused lives is we either don't know the passcode or don't use it. So the benefits that are available to be accessed are not accessed because the passcode has been ignored, rejected, or unknown. One of the big questions that we all have with our lives is what God wants us to do. How does God want us to do it? What, how do we move forward in this thing called life, given all the chaotic realities that we face? How do we navigate our existence well, there's a passcode. And if you know this passcode and if you use this passcode, you will be pleasantly surprised at what is available to you from the Lord for your life. The passcode to which I am referring and to which I would like to speak about today and I'll call to return to God is the passcode simply called Surrender. When you understand this code and activate it in your life, my life, our lives, we will gain access to God at a whole nother level. Unfortunately, this is a code people don't like or don't want. And so it often goes unutilized, leaving us blocked out of what is available to us when it comes to this thing called living. Paul the Apostle in one of the famous passages in Scripture talks about this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He's speaking to Christians. He says in verse 1 of Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brethren, that includes sisterin. I urge you, brethren, I urge you, Christians. I beg you, I entreat you. I'm, I'm crying out to you. He speaks in intensive terminology because he really wants the saints in Rome and the saints in Dallas to hear it. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body a living and holy sacrifice. He says, Christians, I want you to surrender. That is, I want you to give all of you to all of God. I want you to give all of you to all of God. Surrendering is where you yield your humanity and every part thereof to all of God. He says, I urge you to do this. Why is he urging you to do this? He says, present your body a living sacrifice. 
Because whatever God is going to do in, with, and through you, he's going to do it in the context of your humanity. If he wants to speak to you, he's going to have to have access to your ears. If he wants to deliver a thought to you, then he's going to have to have access to your mind. If he wants to speak through you, then he has to have access to your mouth. If he's going to guide you, he has to have access to your feet. So in order for God to do with you what is needed to be done, he must have access, which means that the code must be punched of surrender where you present your body a living sacrifice. He says, now the reason you should be motivated to do this is the mercies of God. He says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, his compassionate favor toward us should be the motivating factor of the surrender. He has spent 11 chapters talking about the matter the mercies of God, before he ever gets to chapter 12. In chapter 1 through chapter 3, he says the whole world needs mercy because the whole world is guilty before a holy God. That God can't dumb down his standards in order to meet our needs. He must keep his standards the same. And so all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 But he comes in chapter 4 and he says, but God has come up with a way to provide the righteousness that he demands apart from works by faith in Jesus Christ. He says, not to the one who works is the reward given, but to the one who believes on him. It is your faith in Christ that gains you the righteous standard that God demands. In chapter 5, he says, having placed faith in Christ, you have access to a whole new world of grace where even during the tough times of life, God is there to sustain you. In chapter 6, he says, this gives you a whole new identity because you were buried with him in baptism, you were raised to a new life, and you are to look at yourself through new eyes. He comes in chapter 7 and says, that does not mean you will not struggle. He says, there will be struggle with the old you battling against the new you for control of you, which leads him to chapter 8. In chapter 8, he says, that's why God has given us the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit can override the flesh, so that you can live out the new life that God has provided you at salvation. He comes to chapter 9 through 12, And the question is, well, if this is so good, why doesn't Israel, God's people in the flesh, have it? And he says, they don't have it because they don't believe it. And when you don't believe it, you don't get it. And then he says, therefore, I urge you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because of the favor of God given to those who place faith in Jesus Christ, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to give all of you to all of him because your humanity will be the mechanism through which what God has to do will be made manifest, but he must have access to it. He says, now, the way you make this presentation is by complete surrender, present your body a living and holy sacrifice. This surrender is all of you. It's not like the story of the chicken and the pig who were walking down the street one day and they came across a grocery store that said, bacon and eggs desperately needed. (laughs) Chicken looked at the pig, pig looked at the chicken, the chicken said, you know, the grocer needs some bacon and eggs. Why don't we help the grocer out? I'll give him some uh, eggs and and pig, you give him the bacon. The pig looked at the chicken and said, you got to be out of your mind. The chicken said, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? Uh, I can give them the egg, you can give them the bacon. He said, no, that is a problem. Because for you, it's a contribution. For me, it's the whole thing. (laughs) 
See, what a lot of folk want to do is give God an egg here and an egg there, here an egg there, an egg everywhere, an egg, egg, when God wants some pork chops, ham hocks, and bacon. He wants the whole thing. He says, present yourself a living sacrifice. Now, that's a contradictory phrase. That, that phrase is contradiction. Present yourself alive, living, but present yourself a sacrifice, dead. Sacrifices were killed. You put sacrifices on the altar. When Christ is a sacrifice, he died on the cross. Sacrifices are killed. He said, present your body as a living, dead thing as a living sacrifice. How can you be living and dead at the same time? Perhaps Paul can help us here in the great scripture where he says in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. I'm alive. Yet not I, because I'm dead. It's Christ who lives in me, so I'm alive. Well, how you doing both, Paul? Well, he says in Galatians 2.20, the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if Paul were standing here today and you were to ask Paul, Paul, what are, you plan what are your plans? Paul would say, I don't have any until God gives them to me. If you, Paul were here, you'd say, well, what are your goals? Well, he says, I'm waiting to get instructions from the Lord so that I know what my goals ought to be. To put it another way, it means dying to self and living to him, choosing him over you. It is saying no to you when you contradict him. He wants you to be a walking dead thing. Alive to him, dead to you when it contradicts him. He says, present your body a living sacrifice. He also says, present it holy. Now, the word holy is a little different than the word righteous. Righteous has to do with the standard of right and wrong. So it's sin versus that which is not sinful. That's, that's righteous. Holy is a unique term. It is a, a defining term of God. God is never called love, 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 truth, truth, truth. Righteous, righteous, righteous. But he is called holy, holy, holy holy to the third power. It is, a, it is a, a, a comprehensive statement about the uniqueness of God. The word holy means to be set apart as unique. There's one whole book in the Bible that deals with the holiness of God. It doesn't get a lot of attention because of its uh, 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 ceremonial emphasis and that's the book of Leviticus where the holiness of God is emphasized. God puts up a no trespassing sign to not trample on his holiness and three concepts are there that help us to understand holiness. So the holiness of God while it includes the righteous standards of God refers to the uniqueness of God for which he is to be held. He says, I beg you, brethren, to give all of you to all of him, to surrender yourself to God. Then he says, this is your spiritual service of worship. That's how the New American Standard says it. If you have a King James Version, it says, which is his, your reasonable service. But the Greek word there is a worship term. He says, your spiritual service of worship is in your total surrender, not your church attendance. So you could be in church, but not worshiping because you aren't surrendered. Without the surrender, there is not the worship. So unless there is the willingness of yielding all of me to all of him, then you can wave your hand in the air like you just don't care, but you're not worshiping. You can shout, you can sing, you can speak the word, you can amen, but it is not worship if it's not including surrender. He calls that your spiritual service of worship. He then comes in verse 2 and he says, and be not conformed to this world. We explain 
that this is referring to what a potter does with clay. He conforms it into an image. Squeezes it and makes a plate. Squeezes it and makes a cup. Squeezes it and makes a saucer. In other words, he shapes it and conforms it. And what he does to do that is apply pressure. Pressure to conform it into the shape he wants it. You and I live in a world that is trying to pressure us to conform to its values. It's trying to squeeze us to accept its worldviews. It's time trying to press us to walk away from what God says and operate on what society says. It is trying to force us to jettison the truth of God for the lies of culture. And you hear it all the time. You hear Christians caving in to the pressure because they don't want to be canceled. You hear people, Christians, who name the name of God caving into the pressure because they don't want to be rejected. Because they demand to be accepted by this world system, not knowing that God says, if you accept the world, you lose me. He says, do not be conformed, pressed, pressured to adopt the value system that leaves me and my world view out. Don't allow the system to kick me to the curb in your value system. You see it all around us today where the rules have changed at warp speed. And they want to make you accept it. They've changed in education. They've changed in media. They've changed in corporations. They've changed in Disneyland. And they want to force and their, your children and your youth are, are in this, this conforming thing. And you know how you feel when your child comes home and you say one thing and then they say, but my friends say. And you have to get them straight. You have to get them straight. I don't care what your friends say. I'm your mama. Well, when God hears what the world is doing to us, he says, I don't care what your friends say. I don't care what they say out there. I'm your God. We are being squeezed and pressured and pressed to adopt the value systems. And I want you need to know in this post-modern age, the pressure is going to keep coming. And that's why you have to fight spiritually, because they're going to press you to adopt a system of values that leave God's value system out. He says, be not conformed to this world. Don't let this world system determine your value system. But let that value system be determined differently and distinctly. And he tells you how. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. First thing he says is give God all of you, living sacrifice. Second thing he says is give the world none of you, do not be conformed. But then he says be transformed, that's a different word. It's the word metamorphosis. It's a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Transform, conform is outside pressure. Transform is change within. The butterfly is embedded in the caterpillar, becomes a chrysalis, and then a cocoon, and then it emerges. The reason why we're not having emerging change on the outside is we're not being transformed on the inside. And the reason we're not being transformed on the inside is because the world is conforming us, and we haven't surrendered. Once surrendering takes place, and you say no to the value systems of the world, the word transform in the Greek is passive, God takes over and begins the transformation process. 
This is a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. Then one day, he was shooting for some food, and up from the ground came a bubbling crude, oil that is, Texas tea. <laughs> Jed Clampett. Ellie Mae. Jethro. Grandma made up a family known as the Beverly Hillbillies. These hillbillies were from the hills of Tennessee, struck oil, and became multi, multi millionaires. They relocated to Beverly Hills. But the thing that made the program so funny was they brought Tennessee values with them. So they were in a new world, but operating by old values. And you know what that made them? A joke. Because even though they were now wealthy with new resources, they were operating from an old world view. And Mr. Drysdale, as much as he wanted to make life better for them, couldn't because they would not let go of how they were raised. They weren't let, wouldn't let go of what they had become accustomed to. And one of the reasons we're not progressing is we're still tied into how we were raised. We're still tied into the secular viewpoints of our secular education, of our non-Christian perspective, or what the media is trying to force down our throats. And because we are buying into that, we may belong to the kingdom of God, but we brought the kingdom of hell with us. And therefore, not taking advantage of all that God has for us because of a refusal to surrender. He says, this is a transformation of the mind. What God will begin to do as you take the truth of his word, having surrendered the life, having said no to the values that discard God and his truth, is he will begin to reshape and reorder your thinking. Because you're now bringing your thoughts in line with him. He will not allow that to germinate within you if he has to compete with the values of the world that you embrace. But he says, I will transform your mind and bring my thinking into your thinking so that my thoughts become your thoughts. See, that's when, when, when God is taken over, when what he's thinking, you're thinking at the same time he's thinking it. So your framework is beginning to shift and the butterfly within you is beginning to form. Because he now has full access to you because you're fully surrendered. Yes to him, no to the world. And so his spirit can reshape the thoughts. And you know, when a believer is not conformed to God, but conformed to the world, because they will reject what God says in favor of what the world says. Or in favor of how they were raised. Or in favor of what they think. Even though you show them clearly what God says. Well, the question is, well, what's the payoff for this? If I go this way, if I go this route, well, what's, what's the benefit? He tells you in verse 2, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Guess what the payoff is? The will of God. The will of God for you. Now watch this. God has a will, a plan for every life. When you accept Christ, you have now entered into the plan. That plan covers every detail of your existence from the time of your conversion to the time of your death or the rapture. He has a will. We deviate from that will because of our own carnality, our own fleshliness. But when we get on track, 
through submitting to God and saying no to the world. There's a transformation of thinking that takes place and you will prove what is the will of God. He says you will prove what the will of God is. Now let me give you the good news. The good news is if you give God all of you, give the world none of you, become renewed in your thinking, you won't have to find God's will. God's will will find you. He says, you will prove. That means you will see unfolding. You will see working out the will of God because he's gone ahead of you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It is his governing guidance through situations, circumstances, people, to even through problems that he begins to steer things and interrelate things. And then he says, perfect. It means it will complete its goal. If you don't want to live an incomplete life, he says, operate in the will of God. And you do that by giving God all of you, giving the world none of you, and letting God shift your thinking into his value system. And then he feels comfortable to govern, guide, direct, correct, change, tweak. And the beautiful thing about it is you can make that decision now. We don't have to continue to live in uncertainty with regard to what God is doing, not because we know it all, but because we know he's going to shape our thinking and bring his thoughts into our thoughts so that our thoughts are his thoughts so that we know how to think in terms of his will. One of the great experiences of life is seeing God change your mind. Amen. You were thinking about going one direction and he brings things around so that you think differently about that thing, about that job, that career, that, that move that you want to make. I mean, or, or, or reinforce your mind about something. It's where he... Inter-